All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining this talk. Um, so my name is Guillaume Fournier, but you can call me Will. And this is Hemant Smala. So we are from Datadog. Um, Datadog is a cloud observability and security platform. So essentially, our mission is to uh, help customers understand um, how their infrastructure is doing, um, you know, how our applications are uh, running, and if there, there is anything uh, wrong with them and how to fix it. So today, what we're going to talk about is essentially uh, a bit of backstory around how we use EPPF um, in a couple of products, and more specifically, um, you know, gotchas and, and pitfalls that we fell or not into while working on um, uh, security products based on EPPF. And then Hemant is going to talk about uh, a bit of uh, uh, you know incidents, a few incidents that happened um, with CDM at Datadog because we extensively use um, CDM in our infrastructure. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so before I jump into it, I um, just want to stress the fact that I don't want to say by this talk, with this talk, that we shouldn't use eBPF for security. Um, there are a lot of use cases for which it is totally valid to use eBPF. Although it is excruciatingly hard in some cases, and that's pretty much the goal of this talk, which is to bring forward all the issues we encountered as we were building these products um, over the past few years. All right, so again, I'm going to talk about a product that we that is called Cloud Security Management. And um, I wanted to share a bit of context so that you know what we want to do and why we have chosen EBPF to do it. So the goal, um, so this product was launched early in 2020. And our goal is to uh, detect threats at runtime using EBPF uh, in cloud environments. Um, essentially, we have a list of rules that will evaluate pretty much any kind of events at runtime um, that you may care about. Um, and based on these uh, behavioral analysis, we're able to trigger um, you know, signals, um, which are essentially a way to notify customers that something is weird and that they might need to investigate. Um, when we initially started, we had a couple product requirements um, to you know, target customers and to know what we wanted to support. And initially, the goal was to uh, basically support all major Linux distributions, which is, um, yeah, a lot. <laughs> and um, which also means that we had to be compatible all the way down to 4.12 kernels, which, again, is a lot, maybe too much. Um, and uh, we also had to be cloud agnostic, so like support all cloud providers, um, support laptops, as well as instances in, in the cloud, and all cl um, container runtime. Also, part of those requirements, we um, you know, knew what we needed to, uh, uh, to write the detections we wanted to, to write, which means that we had to build and monitor a historical process tree. So what this means is we don't want to just have the view of the kernel of the process tree. Um, I'm sure everybody here knows that in some cases, a process can be reattached to PID1 um, if one of its parents died. And that's an issue because in the context of security, you want to know where this process comes from and you can't just you know, rely essentially on ProcFS to tell you this context. So this meant that we had to stream all execution, exit, fork events to user space to build an historical process tree and then run our detections in user space. Similarly, our rules can be written on a wide variety of events, um, going all the way from you know, execution events to uh, file system activity, network activity, and so on. All right, so now what I'm going to do is talk about 10 hoopsies that we encountered while working on this project. And um, yeah, they will be categorized in three uh, different chapters. So the first one is going to be around hook points. The second one is going to be about the data you collect. And the third one is going to be about the environment. All right, so let's go. Sorry, your hook point wasn't called. So, um, yeah, just before I jump into it, just one more thing. Um, again, going back to the product requirements, this means that we had to use only K probes, trace points, and TC classifiers. Um, we could and probably should have used VPF LSM, but because of you know compatibility issues, um, unfortunately, this was not um, a, a, you know an option for us. Also, uh, we need to collect circle arguments and return values. Um, this is more to give a context around what happening, what's happening, more than anything else. And um, what it means is like the way it works for pretty much all our different event types is that we usually have a program on an entry point, so like the syscall entry, and then we have a couple of other programs uh, hooked into kernel internals to collect more data. Um, and all of this is aggregated into an EPF context map, and essentially we send one final event uh, on syscall exit. This will have consequences in the future, uh, good and bad, but 
that's important to understand that this is basically how uh, the solution works. All right, so let's go. Hoop scene number one. Um, yeah, so the first point is like, um, you have missing hoop points. Um, it, it, like there are a couple of edge cases where if you're not careful, you can have blind spots and bypasses simply because you're not hooked everywhere you should be hooked um, to actually catch everything that's happening. Uh, a very common one is uh, trying to handle 32 bits programs on 64 bits um, machines. Because if you don't hook on all the different compatibility layers with K-probes uh, for all the, hook, the syscalls you care about, then you're pretty much just going to uh, miss some of them. Um, so for example, you need to hook on sys underscore syscall, as, uh, uh, well, sorry, along with compact underscore uh, sys, and uh, like for any other compatibility here that might be uh, in the kernel. Another one is around trace points. So um, there are specificities with trace points, again, when it comes to 32-bit syscall. Syscalls. Um, so normal syscall trace points, so I'm sure you know, but like um, there are two kinds of trace points, like I mean, default trace points, you can have one per syscall that is uh, already defined. And also there is the row syscall, sysexit and sysenter, which is a more uh, uh, generic because it will trigger for any kind of syscall. And the point is the first type of, sys of trace points will not trigger for 32 bits um, binaries. And um, again, that's an issue because that's another way to bypass the solution if you were to use trace points. So yeah, so essentially what it means is we need to use the raw, the raw syscall um, hook point and also make sure to translate the syscall IDs to the right values so that you understand which syscall is getting called. All right, oopsies number two. So also I forgot to mention, um, we didn't have this issue um, within our product because we noticed that it was important. So before we even went GA, like we actually supported um, the correct hook points. The next one, however, is a bit more dumb, but we did forget about it. Forget about it. So um, yeah, we need to look out for new syscalls. So open at two was open, was added in kernel 5.6. Um, yeah, and we did not keep up uh, really uh, close enough to uh, the new syscalls API. And the point is, um, we had a bypass because of this. Another one is IO ring. Um, so I'm, I'm sure everybody knows what it is, but essentially it's a way to uh, run asynchronous syscalls in uh, the kernel. And the issue with this is again, you can run some operations that actually you care about, but because they will not call the functions you are hook on, hooked onto, you will not get you know, uh, calls and you will have bypasses again. Um, one small disclaimer, if you eventually hook the right IO ring function that will uh, do the operation that you care about, you also need to make sure that you have a way to match to the correct process context, because otherwise if you just use the default helpers, um, you will actually get the process context of a key worker, which is not what you want. All right, hoops C number three. Um, so this one is around max active and hardware interrupts. So the max active one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, this option is a way to control how many uh, um, concurrent calls can be made to carry probes, I mean, to the functions that you hook and to the correct carry probe that you hook. Um, and depending on the kernel version, this parameter is actually not configurable, which is an issue because under pressure, it's pretty much sure that if you just use the number of CPUs, you're going to have overlaps and um, yeah, you're going to miss context and, and again, biases. So what this call, this means for this is, again, you need to use process syscalls instead of K-red probes um, and specifically the one that is about exits, um, the exit trace point. Hardware interrupts is a bit more involved. So the thing is like, if you hook a function that can be called from the context of interrupt, then this function in some very specific cases might, I mean, the k-probe that you put on it might not get called. And the reason for this is the classic re-entry, uh, um, you know, uh, safeguard that the k-probe API has, um, which is just to make sure that, you know, one uh, um, context cannot uh, hook into multiple, uh, cannot trigger multiple uh, uh, k-probe uh, recursively. And the point is, um, yeah, if you do this, again, your k-probe is not going to get triggered and then you're going to lose coverage. Um, so one example of this is the TCP set state hook point. Um, if you hook on this one, in some cases, it will not get triggered, which is a problem. All right, and the last one for this section is about um, hook points on kernel modules. Um, so if a kernel module, I mean, if you actually hook on functions that are uh, part of a kernel module, when the kernel module gets reloaded, removed, uh, and, and so on, you will uh, lose your program if you do not reintroduce it. Um, and similarly, if for whatever reason you start before the kernel module is loaded, then you won't be able to instrument it. And then again, missing hook points means bypasses. All right, chapter two. Next time, make sure you actually get the data you need. 
See, this one is pretty famous because a lot of people have been talking about it, specifically at Black Hat. Um, but it's simply about you know the same old bypass of um, talk to with pointers to values in user space from syscall parameters um, to jump into uh, I know I mean have a look at the the talk uh, at Black Hat is pretty self-explanatory and it's uh, very detailed as to how to do it but essentially the TLDR is depending on when we actually check the content and the value in user space um, well the data may, may change compared to what the kernel has actually uh, read. So the point here, and that's why I, I told you before that we have actually internal uh, hook points in the kernel and not just syscall level ones, is because in, for the pointer values, essentially what you need to do is uh, copy the data from the kernel and not copy the data from user space. This way you know that what you get is actually what was used by the kernel and not something else. All right, so this one is another one that is actually uh, pretty common um, and, and that you can't do much about. It's about lost events. Um, so essentially when you have you know, a fixed size ring buffer to send event to user space under pressure at some point, you are bound to um, start dropping events and uh, losing coverage. Um, there is not much to say about this apart from try to push kernel filters as much as possible to reduce the number of events that you bring back to user space as much as possible. But yeah, this one is uh, really uh, depending on the workloads that you're trying to monitor and how accurate your kernel space filterings are. All right, I don't know what happened. All right, so until I get there, um, the last one is interpreters. Um, so this is a famous one because uh, for all or any other solution that only looks at syscall parameters, you are actually going to miss this completely. Um, the point here is, you know, when you have rules that actually look at uh, executable path or stuff like that, um, you're not going to actually look into the script that is getting executed. And for that reason, what you see from the syscall point of view is that you know xyz.sih script is getting executed, but you're not looking at the interpreter. And the problem is the interpreter itself could have been something that you would have triggered a rule for. Um, and just looking, again, just looking at syscalls, it's not enough. So that's another point why it's very important to have more um, involved kernel space hook points. Otherwise, you're just not going to have this context. Um, yeah, so essentially don't forget to write rules on interpreters and also don't forget to uh, actually, uh, you know, collect the data around interpreters. All right, so the last chapter is about the environment. So essentially, you know, make sure not to destroy the environment you work with and also um, make sure the environment cannot stop your solution from working. Um, so we've actually already talked about this one at CiliumCon this year with Hemanth. Um, essentially, there was an incident between um, um, Cilium and, and Datadog where uh, the two products were canceling each other. Uh, it was based on a race because of the TC uh, subsystem. Um, again, I, I'm not going to jump to, I mean, take too much time um, talking about this one, but what it means is if you want to use TC, um, you need to be aware that other people are using TC um, and you need to follow a couple of guidelines if you uh, want to be nice with them and make sure that you're not going to uh, bypass whatever uh, infrastructural uh, uh, use case or security use case they have implemented. So the rules are pretty simple. Um, never answer TC act okay. Uh, the reason is you want other filters to be called. Uh, it's not because it's okay for you that it's okay for others. Um, second one is never hard code the handler of the filter because um, you know, we don't have a unique source of truth uh, containing all the handlers of all the different vendors up there. So um, if you let the kernel decide and if you accept the uh, value generated by the kernel, then, um, well, it's much better because you don't have uh, a, uh, conflicts with other products. Never delete the CDS Act QDisk. Um, so again, this one is self-explanatory, but because this is a racy system by design, um, by the time you have decided to, I mean, between the time you have decided to remove the QDisk and the time you actually do it, an other product might have loaded kernel filters. And the last one is make your priority configurable so that um, you know multiple uh, uh, products can actually be uh, organized depending on what uh, users are uh, actually deploying in production. All right, hoops number nine. So um, this one is about out of memory kills, right? Again, it's pretty random because it's completely depend. I mean, it only depends on the tool you're you are actually writing and also how you are deploying it. But essentially, if you set memory limits, 
to um, an agent that you use to, uh, for, for security, then uh, depending on um, you know, the memory pressure and the load that the machine is on, it is likely that at some point memory will need to be reclaimed. And well, bad news for you, if you reclaim an agent that holds uh, um, k probes, then essentially you're going to lose coverage and you're going to lose your k probes. So what this means is like it, it's really just about like trying to find a balance, and it's, it's ultimately a product choice uh, between system availability and and system security. Um, yeah, so there is no real uh, solution for this one, unfortunately. <laughs> and the last one, but not the least. Um, there are a couple of kernel parameters that can be used to disable tracing, um, so specifically k-probes or other uh, function uh, tracing features, and um, which is, by the way, great. Like there is no reason why we should remove them, but the issue is it's very hard to monitor them. Um, we found kind of a workaround to do it, but without this workaround, you can't really know if um, you know the, the system is enabled or not because regardless of their value, you will always be able to load the k-probes. So even if k-probe all disarmed and f-trust enabled or f-trust disabled are set to true or false, depending on the case, you will always be able to load the k-probes and no one will tell you if those k-probes are actually working. So the workaround that we found to um, try to check the values of these uh, uh, different parameters is simply to send what we call an ERPC call. So it's a very uh, barbarous uh, name to say that we just fake a syscall that is intended to a very specific um, hook point and a very specific uh, function that we implemented. I mean, you know, EBPF program that will just send a ping back to user space saying, hey, this is the values of those different parameters. And also we're still working. We're still, you know, uh, up and running, so all good. Um, yeah, so I mean, the answer to this is switch to BPF at SM when you can and when your compatibility matrix allows it. Um, but apart from this, uh, the other option is to do what we did. All right, and that's it for me. Hemant, take it away. Uh, thanks, Will. So uh, in this section, I'll be talking about uh, some of the challenges we ran into while using eBPF for networking, uh, primarily through Cilium. Uh, so quick intro, like I'm an engineer on the compute data plane team at Datadog, so which means that we are responsible for all things container networking at Datadog. And at Datadog, we run uh, most of our infrastructure on Kubernetes, and we use Cilium to power the networking layer uh, in our Kubernetes clusters. And um, Daniel spoke about uh, most of this earlier today, but a quick introduction. Uh, so Cilium primarily has a component called Cilium Agent, which runs on every single node in your Kubernetes cluster and is responsible for doing things like installing BPF programs, uh, assigning IP addresses to parts and things like that. And Cilium mostly uh, installs TC or XTP uh, BPF programs and uh, Cilium allows us to get rid of queue proxy. Uh, so using Cilium, we are able to use eBPF instead of IP tables for most of the service implementation. And in addition to that, we also use Cilium for uh, things like policy enforcement, IPAM, and other eBPF related uh, speed ups. So in this section, I'm gonna talk about uh, three different issues that we ran into. So the first one is uh, service connectivity issues. So the this started as an incident where uh, one of our users reached out to us saying that they were not able to access one of their Kubernetes service. And a uh, quick background on Kubernetes services. Uh, so class, uh, the Kubernetes service of type cluster IP is the default Kubernetes service, which basically gives you a virtual IP that represents your entire cluster. And you can use that virtual IP to access the service from anywhere in the Kubernetes cluster. So Cilium basically implements this uh, uh, client-side load balancing logic using eBPF maps and BPF programs. Um, and there was a completely unrelated feature called graceful termination where Cilium also watches for parts that are entering terminating state and proactively removes them from the services backends so that the uh, so the workloads that are getting terminated do not get any new requests. But there was a bug uh, in the cleanup logic. If the Kubernetes service was deleted when one of the backends was in terminating state, uh, some of the backends were left behind. Uh, what makes this harder is that uh, Cilium actually maintains an in-memory count of uh, total number of backends uh, in the BPF map. It does that because it's actually expensive to calculate the uh, map size. So when we use the Cilium CLI, like uh, Cilium CLI told us that the backends V2 had only 3,000 entries. But when we use BPF tool on the node, we were actually saturating the uh, BPF map. So this, uh, we reported this issue upstream and it was fixed pretty quickly. 
Uh, and this was really a corner case uh, with, a, with a very uh, a race condition that happens very rarely. But the learning for our, from this incident for us was that uh, we realized that we had no monitoring on BPF map usage whatsoever. So we were looking for a metric that allows us to track our BPF map usage. And in the, at the same time, Cilium was in the process of building a new metric called Cilium BPF map pressure. Uh, this metric is actually interesting uh, because it doesn't actually cover all the BPF maps that are currently used by Cilium. This is primarily because of a few limitations with LRU BPF maps. Uh, the limitation is that um, if the kernel evicts an existing entry to make room for new ones, there's no way for the user space to know about it. So uh, for a long time, um, any map that uses, uh, any feature that uses LRU BPF map was not included in this. Um, and connection tracking was one of the feature that was using LRU BPF maps. Uh, but luckily, I think Song implemented a, a new API, uh, which, allows you, which allows you to batch requests and use batch API to measure the size of the map a lot more efficiently. Uh, and Cilium started using this uh, batch API to basically estimate the BPF map size on the, uh, the real BPF map size using this API, and it is a lot more efficient. And on top of this, uh, Anton also built a new feature that allows you to export native stats from the kernel directly. And using both of these features, now you can have full observability into uh, the total map size uh, on your nodes. And this is not yet included in Cilium, but uh, I think it should uh, it'll make its way soon. And there's also a, a detailed talk about this entire topic by Joe in one of the previous LPC uh, sessions. If you're interested, check it out. Um, and a few more gotchas. So if you want to help your users uh, make right size their BPF maps, Cilium has this interesting flag called BPF map size dynamic ratio, which basically allows you to look at the total amount of memory that's available on the host, and it will proportionally size your BPF maps on startup. And uh, depending on how big users Kubernetes clusters get, and depending on how many workloads they have in these clusters, your users might eventually want to resize their BPF maps uh, for different reasons. And in our environment, we realized that uh, whenever these BPF maps ma were being resized, we were seeing a few uh, packet drops, and packet drops due to missed tail call events. Um, so I don't fully understand the details behind this, and I think it's being worked upstream to uh, get this address, but the takeaway here is that uh, resizing BPF maps, especially the tail call maps, is tricky in production, and I think it's uh, racy. Um, so the uh, next one is uh, Cilium identity corruption. Um, this also started with uh, one of our users complaining that um, one of our users complaining that they were seeing some unexpected packet drops from the Cilium's policy enforcement engine. So uh, the Cilium identity is basically composed of two components. So the first one is the local pod identity within a cluster and the cluster ID. There's one unique cluster ID for every uh, cluster you can allocate during the provisioning time. And our Kubernetes provisioning uh, system internally assigns a random number between 0 and 255 for every Kubernetes cluster we create. So in Cilium's data path, this identity is basically serialized into the kernel's SKB mark, and it's restored uh, in, at a later stage in the data path. And unfortunately, um, and this is an example of how the these bits get shuffled around from the identity. So at the top, you can see the two parts, which is the local pod identity and the cluster ID. And they get shuffled and serialized to the kernel's SKB mark. And so unfortunately, there was a completely unrelated feature to support uh, multi-node node ports in AWS CNI, where that feature was also using the same uh, eighth bit, uh, a single bit. But sometimes this eighth bit would get uh, restored, and that would basically mess up the cluster ID part of it. So we were seeing these packet drops only in clusters that were using uh, cluster IDs greater than 128. So there's an unofficial registry uh, that's being maintained by folks at Isovalent uh, that basically documents every project that's using the kernel's SKB mark. So the takeaway here is if you're planning on using the kernel's SKB mark, make sure you take a look at who else is using it and um, or add, in, add new entries to that. 
So the last one I wanted to talk about is uh, trying to use SK reuse port in combination with uh, BPFS KSign. So Cilium has a feature called 2FQDN network policies, which allows you to basically have a uh, uh, have network policies against a fully qualified domain name. Uh, and Cilium implements this by having a DNS proxy. So Cilium intercepts all the DNS requests that are coming from your pod using a DNS proxy, and it uh, intercepts them using either uh, BPFS KSign or I think a legacy way of using tproxy. But once the DNS requests are intercepted, the DNS proxy would make the upstream requests. And once those uh, DNS names are resolved, Cilium would plumb the data path with the corresponding CIDR policy. And then the response would be sent back to the Kubernetes part. And the part then tries to uh, connect to its destination service, and the policy would be enforced. But the problem with this approach is that the DNS proxy's lifecycle is very tightly coupled with the Cilium agent's lifecycle. So whenever we do a rollout of Cilium agent, uh, the DNS proxy would also be also go down, and that was problematic. And we wanted to solve for that. So we uh, uh, we in, we we were building a standalone DNS proxy that would run alongside the Cilium agent's DNS proxy, and so that we can load balance between uh, both of these proxies. And even if Cilium agent is unavailable for some reason, the request would still go through. And we wanted to take it one step further and uh, try and use a BPF program on the reuse port group to basically customize the load balancing behavior and send requests to the Cilium agent's built-in DNS proxy if it's available and running, and send it to the standalone DNS proxy only if the primary agent is unavailable. So we built a POC uh, and tested it out, and everything worked great. But when we plugged it into Cilium's data path, uh, things did not work. Uh, so we wanted to understand why this was happening. So we wrote a small BPF trace script to basically trace the reuse port select sock function. And we realized that uh, in Cilium's data path, the SKB variable is being wiped out. And turns out there is actually a limitation in the kernel, uh, which has been addressed very recently by uh, Lawrence. So if you try to use uh, SK reuse port BPF programs, with BPF SK assigned, the SKB value would be wiped out. And uh, the function that actually uh, does triggers the reuse port BPF programs looks at the SKB value. And if there is nothing in it, it would basically default to round robin load balancing. And your BPF program never gets invoked. So with this patch, uh, everything works as expected. Um, yeah, so it's just a gotcha. Yeah, thank you. That's pretty much uh, all we had for today. <laughs> Okay, I, I got one question for the, you said, mentioned earlier the TCP set state doesn't work. Can you give more details why, why it doesn't work? No? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so essentially the idea is, um, you know how K-probes right now have, I mean, they've always had that, like, they have a fail safe when you actually trigger it, a, a K-probe and like, when a K probe is called, you actually have a check to see if a K probe is already running in the context of the CPU. And essentially, the idea is hardware interrupts are a way to, um, I mean, depending on how the priorities work, the, uh, you know, the resolution after a hardware interrupt can be piled on a soft uh, uh, interrupt tender. And, and the, the thing is, if the, this resolution will call another hook point that you have hooked a K probe onto, since you still have a Kepra burning, it will not be triggered. And that's essentially what happens with uh, um, TCP set state, because I, you can actually check it right now if you want, um, just by you know, uh, actually printing to screen um, you know, the, the, the okay probe on TCP set state, you'll see that sometimes it is run within the context of an interrupt tender. And the point is, this means that, um, well, when this happens, the second Kepra will not get triggered. And this is a loss of coverage, uh, depending on your use case and what you do with it again. But um, yeah, the TCP one is an easy one because you know networking is is uh, obviously uh, more likely to, to have these kind of thing has, things happen. But um, that's the TLDR. Yeah, uh, makes sense. But I think the Todd Jury uh, did this morning may help. He has. Okay. You can try trace point or some other thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, have less chance that you will get. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, the issue, the underlying issue for us here is that we don't, I mean, maybe there are uh, you know, solutions with, with trace mines again, but like if you need to use k-probes and you don't have a choice, then really trying to avoid these functions is the only way to go. Um, and, you know, most of the issues I, I presented today, honestly, is based on the fact that we had to be compatible with old kernels, which means that we had to use k-probes. Um, if we were to build it today with the technologies that are in the kernel right now, uh, we would pretty much likely not be using gay verbs. <laughs> Can you elaborate again on the K-probes disarm thing that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, like, so sure. what happens? So basically, it will unload all the the, the K-probes or trace points that are currently attached, right? So um, I would need to double check. Honestly, I don't remember, but like, I know that K-probes will be affected by the K-probe disarmed for sure. Um, I think they are also affected by the F-trace enabled uh, um, uh, knob. And then the F trace disabled one is uh, because of, uh, you know, when you have a fault in the kernel, there, uh, just to protect itself, or at least that's my understanding, uh, the kernel will, you know, turn on this, this knob and, 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 you know, from this point on, no more K pros will be triggered. Um, this one is more of a security feature. You can't do anything about it. The only way to recover is to restart. But like, um, yeah, so I don't know if <laughs> that answered your question, but essentially if one of these parameters is set either to true or false, depending on the case, um, your hook points will no longer be, be called, and you have no way to know or monitor that someone has actually changed the values. Um, yeah, because like there are just variables in the kernel. And, and, and uh, so, how did you overcome it? I mean, you are monitoring that, or like yeah, <laughs> or, or like a sh like should there be an LSM hook or anything like that to potentially prevent something? Yeah. So maybe what, what I said wasn't um, uh, clear enough. But the idea is from um, slash proc slash kl sims, you can get the address of those different values of uh, those different uh, variables, and then from there, essentially the goal is to periodically check the values at those pointers using a BPF program, and to do this periodically. Um, we could either had uh, uh, used, you know, a perf event that could have been triggered every second, for example, or, um, and this is what we did, um, you trigger a fake syscall. I mean, it is a syscall, so you do an IOCTL syscall with uh, very specific parameters so that a, a, um, a K-probe on one of the internal functions of the IOCTL syscall will, you know, realize uh, if you check for those parameters that, you know, this is actually uh, an API to, <laughs> an API call to do this check. Uh, but it will essentially, you know, when it recognizes those magic parameters, it will look for the values of those different uh, um, uh, knobs and then send an event back to user space. And the point here is two things. First, if you have an event, this means that your k probes are still enabled. And second, uh, we can also check the other values. Uh, um, I mean, you should have all of them to, uh, to make sure that everything is still working properly. So, um, yeah, it is definitely a hack. Um, it is not great. It's not real time. We don't know who changed it, if it got changed. But at least it's a way to know that, you know, you're up and actually in running and not just up without knowing if your hook points will fire. There's another question from Lawrence. Uh, you mentioned that the number of CPUs for setting Max active doesn't always work. Have you found a better heuristic? Um, the bad news is no. Um, the heuristic we use today is uh, set it to 512 and hope for the best. Um, no, uh, I don't think there is really a, a fix here. Um, or if there is one, I, I don't know. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to have a break.